So hi everyone, um, we'll get started now. Uh, welcome back for anyone who's joined us in the past and welcome to anyone who hasn't. Uh, so I'm really excited this week because we've got an incredible woman uh, coming to talk to us about diving, about cave exploring um, and lots of things. So please welcome with me, um, Jill Hayner. I hope I pronounced your name right. Um, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> she, she wears many, many different hats. She's an underwater explorer, a writer, a photographer, a speaker, a podcaster, a filmmaker, and so on and so forth. Um, the list really goes on. So she is a pioneer uh, of technical rebreather diving, which you might find out what that is in the presentation. Um, she has led expeditions into icebergs in Antarctica, volcanic lava tubes, and submerged cave caves all around the world. Um, Jill is the first exploring residence of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. Her book, Into the Planet, that you can see on the screen right now, has been lauded by the Wall Street Journal, the Opera Magazine, and the New York Times. Uh, and Jill is a fellow of the International Scuba Diving Hall of Fame, um, and the Underwater Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Explorers Club. There's a lot to say about Jill here. <laughs> um, she was also awarded with the William Beebe Award for Ocean Exploration. Um, so I'm going to stop there, even though I'm sure there's a long list of other achievements to talk about. Um, she's a bit of a life, uh, a legend and a, a real life superhero, um, but I'll let her introduce herself further um, and talk to you about all of her adventures. So Jill, thank you so much for being here. Um, and I look forward to hearing about what you've got to tell us. Thank you. It's, it's really fun to be here with all of you today, even if it's just online, but at least it gives us a chance to connect globally, which is fantastic. I'm, I'm going to share with you a little bit about my life as an underwater explorer. And um, the expeditions that I've had have taught me a lot of important lessons in life, including the fact that the ocean begins beneath our feet. Wherever you live, the ocean begins beneath your feet. And I'll explain as we go along by taking you on a journey into a dark place that you might have never imagined before. My um, business card actually says explorer on it. And that's the best title that I could think of to describe all the myriad activities that I do to keep me in my favorite environment, which is underwater. Now, as I do my work, you might find me um, underneath the sea ice in a place like this in Canada, or you might find me on top of the sea ice traveling to work on a documentary project. Sometimes, you know, we even spend long stretches camping on the sea ice in the north, which is really an awesome experience. Um, and through that work, I get to interact with some crazy animals that are far more dangerous than sharks, right? Uh, swimming with polar bears to document their life cycle and the changes that climate change is bringing to their environment, or swimming with a mama and baby walruses, which is a really beautiful opportunity. But not all my work is at home in Canada. I travel all around the world to some places that you might not have imagined where people would dive, like the middle of the Sahara Desert. There are actually dive sites there too, strange dive sites like this one that's on the border between Egypt and Libya, um, really remarkable places. But you might also find me in Russia, like in Siberia, underneath the Ural Mountains in the world's longest gypsum cave, this really stunning environment, or inside the Monte Corona volcano in Lanzarote in the Canary Islands. And I get to interact with some pretty amazing animals like these stellar and California sea lions in British Columbia. They're some of my very favorites. 
or my very favorite shark, which are whale sharks. And I'm sure uh, many of you know all about whale sharks, including the fact that they don't have any teeth. They just kind of hoover up the ocean and grab the fish and filter out the water through their gills. But they're amazing and about the size of a school bus, some of them. Now, my work usually involves me taking a camera underwater. So it might be a big video camera or a stills camera. And oftentimes I'm going to places that nobody's ever been before or places where we experience unusual phenomena that people haven't documented before. And that's a great opportunity for me. Now, my specialty area of focus is underwater cave systems, these beautiful places that many people don't even imagine, like the ocean um, begins beneath our feet, and we can tell from our work inside these underwater cave systems. Now, let me take you on a little video journey here for a moment as we travel into this black environment. A lot of people think only of the blackness in underwater cave systems, but um, for me, there's so much more. These are like museums of natural history. So they teach us about Earth's past climate. They teach us about animals that live their entire life cycle in the underwater cave systems. They also teach us about ancient civilizations that have left behind their remains um, in these portals to an underworld, these ceremonial places that are very, very important to their cultures. These places are also though receptacles of everything that happens on the surface of the earth and soaks into the ground to join these groundwater sources. And I think you're going to agree that these places are sometimes like swimming through a crystal chandelier. They're so beautiful. And I have an opportunity to go to a place that nobody's ever been before and bring back the images and the video uh, for people to experience and enjoy. So let me show you a little bit more. But first, I'd like to share with you that I wanted to be an astronaut when I was a kid. I didn't even think about diving at first, but I just wanted to be an explorer. Oh, I'm getting a message from my husband and whoa, off from off camera. Oh boy, he's warning us that we're going to have a fire alarm test. <laughs> the fire department just showed up for a fire alarm test. <laughs> <laughs> so when that goes off, I'm going to apologize momentarily while you hear some loud ringing that's going to startle me. <laughs> anyway, it is what it is. What's a Zoom call without cats, babies, and fire alarm tests and leaf blowers outside the window? <laughs> so anyway, I wanted to be an astronaut when I was a kid. And I think that you're going to agree that some of the things that I do are really, really similar to what an astronaut does. And we wear similar equipment, too. I wear a protective dry suit that's much like their pressure suit. And I wear a life support device that's called a rebreather. And that's very similar to what an astronaut uses to make a spacewalk. So that's a pretty cool little, little twist in my work. Now. There's my equipment as opposed to the astronauts equipment. Most people think of scuba divers as someone that uses a single tank on their back, they go underwater and then they make bubbles. Well, with a rebreather, we actually realize there's a lot of really useful stuff that we're exhaling as bubbles. And so we recapture them and we recycle them inside the equipment. So we're actually removing carbon dioxide that I've exhaled and we're adding little bits of oxygen for everything that my body has metabolized since the last breath. So this allows me to go deeper or further into a cave system and not make bubbles. So when I don't make bubbles, then the marine life is really interested because I'm a whole lot more a part of the environment um, than something that scares them off. So like sharks or turtles or other animals will go, hey, what are you? <laughs> and come up to me. 
Now, my exploration career began a long way from the ocean in a cave system in Mexico, where we were searching for the world's deepest vertical cave system inside these mist shrouded rainforest covered mountains. And it was an interesting thing because people in these mountains had to struggle to get drinking water for their families but there was lots of water inside the mountain. There's little holes all over the mountain, sinkholes, where you can rappel down on a rope through like a chimney and get to a point where you're crawling on your hands and knees, sometimes through half-filled water passages, going deeper and deeper and further into the planet. And if I peeled away the mountain and showed you a map, what you would see is about 53 miles, close to 100 kilometers of passageways 25 openings and from the top to the bottom of the exploration about 1560 vertical meters now when an explorer gets to a place like this where they can go no farther unless they go underwater that's where my really fun work begins but for anyone that's a scuba diver in this uh, audience today i think this will kind of wake you up like when I come home at the end of the weekend from scuba diving, sometimes I'm pretty tired and I don't even want to unload the car. I just want to leave the tanks in the car. Well, when you come out of a dive here inside a mountain and you need to get your tank filled, it has to go back up out of the mountain. So across the underground rivers, up through waterfalls, back up two miles of rope to get to the surface where someone can fill the tank and then send it back down again. So that process might take several days and a lot of people to shuttle the gear. Now, back in 1995 on this expedition, we thought, well, gosh, maybe it would be less work if we started from the bottom of the mountain and tried to work our way up inside the mountain. So let's start in the canyon that was cut by the water spilling out of the mountain. So at the bottom of the mountain where the water from the cave system comes out and forms a river, it's actually formed that canyon over a very long period of time. And back in 90, 1994, the water was very clear there. So we thought, ah, this is a really good idea. We'll go bottom up. But when we got there in 1995, the water looked like this, not very appealing for swimmers definitely not very appealing for divers and really, really challenging for a cave explorer because it's one thing to explore when you can hardly see your hands in front of your face, but exploration only counts if we make a map. So we have to bring back like evidence of our exploration or it doesn't count. And really when you think about it, it's no use during doing scientific work or exploration unless you're willing to share the results to make the world a better place, right? So we have to make a map. So at the end of this project, we thought, well, let's brainstorm. How can we make a map even if we can't see the cave? And we sat around a campfire and we brainstormed and thought about some ideas. And together, as a group, as a team, we came up with some ideas. And my colleague, Dr. Bill Stone, said, I can build a special mapping device that won't require us to see the walls or the floors or the ceiling for reference. So two years later, we were there in North Florida testing this equipment. Oh, here goes our fire alarm in the background. <laughs> I'm glad it's not as loud as I was thinking it might be <laughs> in the other room. It's horrible. <laughs> It'll just be a moment longer. <laughs> okay, I think, oh, one more. <laughs> I could say that I think the fire alarm is working and we can all hear it. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, well, there's no fire at my place, so I'll just continue on here. <laughs> so our mapping device here actually works with sonar. So that means it's pinging the walls with sound waves in all these different directions. And it's measuring the time that it takes for the sound wave to come back to the mapping device. And it can turn that into measurements and help us make the 
first ever three-dimensional map ever made of a subterranean space. So an amazing thing and so important, as I'll show you in a moment, as to why we need these accurate maps. So that's me driving this big, huge mapping device that weighs about 150 kilos, just that in and of itself. So on this particular project, we had to build a huge infrastructure as well to handle some really long dives that went way into the earth, as long as three kilometers into the planet from the open water. And all of this equipment enabled us to do missions as long as 22 hours in my case. And we had a whole bunch of volunteers to help us make that happen because these caves are like 90 meters deep. So for any scuba divers out there, that means I was doing five hours of bottom time followed by 17 hours of decompression time, which is a slow staged return to the surface to allow my body to reacclimate to the pressure on the surface. Sometimes I'd be wearing two of those rebreather devices. And then also a lot of other equipment as well, like carrying a mapper, dragging an extra scooter, two rebreathers, five or six extra tanks, and some scientific diving um, packages as well. And all of that could weigh 250 to 300 kilograms as I went away into the planet. But these are the guys that were the real heroes of this project. So. Inside the cave, I'm like about 100 meters beneath them. And I have a radio location beacon and I'm sending a signal through the planet. And these guys are listening for a pinging sound and they're locating themselves right on top of me as I move through the cave system. Now, right here, they're just in an open field, but they had to jump in an, a canoe and paddle through an alligator infested swamp in a river that was above an underground river where I was swimming. And they've tracked me through some other crazy places like industrial parks, underneath a bowling alley, and even um, underneath someone's home here in a golf course community. So they're tracking through this community and they realize, wow, the cave goes right underneath this man's patio in his living room. Let's knock on the door. <laughs> you can imagine how startled it would be if someone knocked on your door and said, cave survey team coming through, right? <laughs> but they also tracked me underneath a Sonny's barbecue restaurant in Florida. And they went right in the side door of the restaurant, right through the tables of diners and found me underneath the salad bar. Again, about in this case, about 90 meters beneath their feet. So pretty crazy to imagine that these cave systems are beneath your feet. But that's what's really important to understand is that I might be swimming through a cave system beneath your feet, but if I can't fit the water can, right? Because when you pour water on the ground, it soaks into the ground in between the grains of sand and the soils, and it keeps going down underneath the ground to join these vast stored bodies of water that are underneath the surface. So the planet is kind of like a sponge. It soaks everything up that we do on the surface of the earth. And anything we do on the surface of the earth can be returned to us to drink. I am swimming through your drinking water. And even more than that, I am swimming through water that serves a lot of other things. So if we think about the journey of water, then that helps us to understand how our lives are intertwined with our water and where it comes from, where it goes to, and how our actions on the surface of the earth can be returned to us to drink or can affect our friends in the oceans. So this is a really important thing to understand. And I know that many young people listening today are going to be interested in pursuing careers involving water and understanding where it comes and goes. So when I'm swimming in a cave, the cave water has velocity. So it's flowing through the earth with current and it pops out in places like this beautiful spring. And you could see the springs in a nice park and we protected the landscape around the spring because it's really beautiful and people love to swim there. But we can't just protect the places where the water comes out of the ground. We have to protect the beginning of the pipeline as well. And that might not be in as beautiful an environment. So how do we do that? 
it means that we need to think about everything because when the water comes out of the cave, it might fill a creek and a beautiful river, and that river might flow downstream to a larger river or a lake, or maybe even a place where a mama manatee is trying to feed her baby, or maybe even to an estuary on the coastline where a nursery of fish are trying to grow up and get their head start before they swim off into the ocean. And the caves are um, like I can swim into these incredibly large environments and find places where I can't fit, but the water is coming from inside the earth and continuing its journey um, beyond the place that I'm at. Now, there's also urban caves as well, stormwater systems that we've created to drain the urban environment, and those affect water as well. So right here, I actually paddled to this part, point in my kayak, and I paddled up a very beautiful protected river called the Wakaiva River. And here I was in a stormwater conduit that was pouring water off the landscape in near Orlando, Florida. Now, for a film that I worked on, we made a journey into the stormwater conduits. And please do not ever, ever do this because these places could very rapidly fill up, right? Unexpectedly, even if it's not raining. So don't do this at home. But when I traveled inside these stormwater conduits, I got a chance to see the things that, that will coat the walls after the water has run through. And there were a lot of nasty chemical compounds and pollutants. And I discovered that the source of that river, the Wakaiva River, was actually in a Best Buy parking lot. <laughs> so it was in a strip mall, right? Because water flows into the ground in these grates, like the one right beside or behind me here. And we could pop out and see that that's where the river really began. It began in the middle of the city in a parking lot. So it's important to understand this because if there's a lot of polluted water running off the environment, when it gets to an estuary like this, it can contaminate this estuary where we want to have a healthy environment for little baby fish, baby sharks, and all kinds of things. But if it's polluted, then you can get an algae bloom, a green algae bloom. And that algae bloom can actually suck up all the oxygen in the water, making it impossible for other things to survive there. Oh, there we go. So some of the things that may pollute the environment include things that are also important to us. And so we need to have a really open mind, like farming, local farming is incredibly important. We want good, healthy local food sources, but we do have to think about how we manage the waste from things like a lot of cows, because if it's all just running off into the ground, then it's carrying all that poop right down into the planet, right? And that will contaminate waterways. But there are other things that cause contamination as well, like how we develop the environment. You see all these ribbons of roads and highways. Well, these are non-permeable surfaces where the water runs off and just collects all the crap that's on these surfaces and lets it run into the ground. And you'll see some little retention ponds here surrounded by trees and, and sometimes by marsh grasses. Those things can help filter the water before it goes into the ground. Uh, but we need to do the best that we can to make sure the water is as clean as possible before it goes underground into our drinking water. Also the way we build, like we all wanna live by the water because it's beautiful to live by the water and see that very soothing water that's so good for our soul. But we can't disturb the natural environment that's important to protect the water. Like a forest or a marsh along the edge of the waterway will help to filter contamination. But if we all like knock down the forest and the marshlands and build golf course style green lawns and then put fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides on them, that's going to soak into the ground and contaminate the water. And that water is going to head onward to the next largest river and lake or maybe even out into the ocean. So here in the Florida Keys, we can see a green algae bloom that's heading from the land out into the ocean, and that can hurt the reefs and damage the environment for fish. So this little algae bloom that left the Florida Keys, it's gonna join the Gulf Stream, a great ocean current, and maybe even carry it as far off as Scotland or anywhere else around the world. That's why we wanna protect the water. But beyond 
understanding like water issues, we want to understand climate change too. And so a lot of my projects are, are um, focusing around climate change issues as well. Like this one, this is Antarctica, where I got to be the first person to cave dive inside an iceberg. It was the largest iceberg in recorded history that calved away from the Antarctic ice shelf. This giant iceberg was the size of Jamaica, this sliver of ice coming up here. And we proposed to be the first people to go cave dive inside this environment and document what was there. But we had to get there from New Zealand and make a 12 day crossing of the Southern Ocean to reach this iceberg, a journey that involves seas up to 20 meters high and definitely involved me absolutely throwing up the entire time. But to have the chance to document these environments and swim inside this massive body of ice was absolutely astonishing to me. These environments rep represent what we call our cryosphere, the ice covered parts of the planet, and they are dwindling as the planet warms. Now, as I mentioned, we had that incredible journey across the Southern Ocean, one that made me so seasick the entire time. I lost a lot of weight just getting there. But these kinds of projects are worth it to get an up close and personal look at how the Earth's climate is working and changing. On our way down, we actually had to jump out onto the the uh, outside of the boat and knock the ice off the boat because it was getting top heavy from all the ice coating the superstructure of the boat. And even once we got there, when we started to dive, it was really challenging to work in these very rapidly changing environments and very difficult weather. And that's why we took our rebreathers again to give us a lot of time to um, swim around and look inside this environment and document some of the life that we saw there, including um, some crazy uh, filter feeding organisms and crustaceans and all kinds of cool animals um, like these. <laughs> so I know this looks a little nightmarish, like a giant spider. It was about the size of my hand. And we saw thousands of these on one particular dive um, in on a dive where the iceberg was actually pinned on the seafloor and we could see all the filter feeding animals that live on the seafloor. So if it was easy, everybody would be doing it or it would have been done before. And so that's why explorers go into these environments because it gives us a chance to help uh, humanity get a better connection with their environment, understand how things work and get bonded to it. Because when you, you know, when you understand sharks, you're no longer afraid of them, you wanna protect them. Or when you understand the whole water system, then you're more careful about how you do things on the surface of the earth. And there's life inside these caves, but it's little life for the most part. So the life that we see in underwater caves are different than things that we see outside of caves. Like this animal doesn't have any eyes and he doesn't have any pigment either. So it's no point to have eyes or pigment if you're living in the blackness of an underwater cave system. But you need to have other strategies. If you can't see, how are you gonna hunt for food, right? So this animal actually has venomous fangs and pincers and can attack something 40 times its size, grab it, inject it with venom, turn its guts into jello and then suck the life out of its prey over time. That's pretty extraordinary. <laughs> and this animal, um, you know, is a family of, in part of a family of crustaceans that might look similar to things that you recognize outside the cave environment. Like this crayfish looks really similar to a river crayfish, right? or there we go, a river crayfish, but the river crayfish has colored eyes and the cave crayfish has no color and no eyes. Pretty cool. <laughs> now we search for those in caves and also in deep ocean environments like here off of Bermuda, where we thought maybe if we went down into what we call the twilight zone of the ocean, perhaps we could find some ancient caves or places where animals, uh, small cave animals live there as well. So we did the deepest manned dives in Bermuda's history to go look at places where the sea level used to be on planet Earth. So we all know that the sea level's rising right now. Well, it's also been very, very much lower than it is today. Like here, 120 meters below the surface today is a spot where the waves used to crash up against a cliff and create this little ledge here. 
And here, my partner and I are collecting biological samples and doing some survey work in order to better understand these environments. And here, we're actually about 140 meters deep looking at a notch that we think might have been an ancient cave. And we look for animals there too. Now, I also do a lot of my work in um, the Bahamas, nice place I get to go for warm water because I live in Canada and so most of the dives that I do are pretty cold. But here, although these look like icicles, these are rock formations inside the cave. And these were created when the ocean levels were lower, when the water table was lower. So this cave would have been dry. The rain would have landed on the surface of the earth and the water would have traveled in between the grains of sand, soaked into the ground and then dripped from the ceiling to the floor in this cave, creating these formations, one drop of water at a time. And they're sort of like icicles or, or like if you dripped candle wax in a pile over time. So they pile up and they pile up. And in this cave, we know that the cave's actually been dry about four times in Earth's history. And we know that partially because of this material that we see in the cave that's orange and red. And this material is actually a foreign invader because this cave's in the Bahamas, but the red material is from the Sahara Desert. So how does dust from the Sahara Desert end up in an underwater cave system? It's kind of a lesson in interconnectivity. So this material is very, very fine. We can disturb it and see that it's a very fine red dust. And this material actually made a journey all the way from the Sahara Desert, being blown up in the atmosphere, traveling across the Atlantic Ocean, raining down on the surface during these dry times on planet Earth. And then it soaks into the ground and drips to the floor and ends up in layers in the cave. And then sometimes other rocks end up being piled up over time on top of that. And we get a formation that glows with the red Sahara dust. And we could bring these formations out of the cave system with a lift bag, like a giant balloon, because it's heavy. We swim it out of the cave and we cut it open. And it's sort of like looking at growth rings from a tree. We count back in time, we find the red Sahara dust that tells us when the cave was dry, when the ocean levels were low, and then we can date the cave to over 350,000 years. So that's a pretty old cave. Now, some of the work that I do is with archaeologists and paleontologists in places like Mexico, where we're diving in places like this. This is called a cenote or a well in the Mayan language. So this is still a drinking water well and has been for many thousands of years. And we're diving inside somebody's drinking water well. And at the top of the picture, where the vertical stripe starts, that's the underside of the drinking water well. And at the bottom here, at the bottom of the pipe, that's where we're drawing water up from inside the cave. And we're diving on the pile of debris underwater to see what's there, like a cow skull or a really strange cow skull like this one that has silver applied to its teeth, so it's an artifact. Or we go deeper down the mound and we find like Spanish colonial water carrying vessels that would have been lowered to collect water like the equivalent of a drinking, bottle, drinking water bottle today, right? So they were, they were hunting for water because it was becoming a very dry time and they were scattered through the environment, finding new places to grow food and new places to get water. And water was a real story um, for the Mayan people. It's not the lost civilization of the Maya because there's lots of Mayan people today, but it became a scattered population who are out dealing with drought and looking for fresh, clean, healthy water to drink. And we learn about their story from some of the pottery and things that we find in caves. And we even find the remains of the Mayan people themselves. So we find you know, human remains in these places that might have been part of different ceremonies or sacrifice rituals in these cave systems. Now, we also find um, ancient animals like this extinct sloth in a cave. And I can't really bring that to a scientist and I wouldn't really want to even if I could. We like to leave all of these things untouched, underwater, undisturbed, protected, right? Because they're pretty well protected here. And if I ever tried to like, 
chisel that out of a cave? Oh my gosh, that would first of all be vandalism. But second of all, I'd probably destroy this ancient extinct sloth. That would be a terrible loss. So today what we do is we actually scan these assets underwater and we bring the data out of the cave for scientists so that they can look at the data and that they can see an entire scanned area and see how things are sitting underwater one in relation to the other. And the scientists are able to um, use a, a unique um, tool um, called a HoloLens, Microsoft HoloLens. And they can actually look through these glasses that Corey's putting on here and see what we call augmented reality assets. So Corey and I scan something like this pot and create a replica, like a hologram that people can interact with and see. And that's an incredible um, opportunity for us to share the data with scientists, but also with um, the people that are so kind to offer us access to their property. And that's, that's really um, important to let them see what we're doing as well. So patient, patient work pays off. And this mapping device that I drove back like mm, 24 years ago in a cave in Florida has continued in its development cycle since that day. And now it's an artificially intelligent robot cave mapping device. And this device can swim through the cave without me. It's called Sunfish. It's an artificially intelligent robot cave mapper and it's got little thrusters all around it. And it can actually swim through the cave and it can explore, whoops, wrong video. <laughs> it can explore on its own and um, see the cave and build that three-dimensional map as it goes. And that's extraordinary because not only will this explore places that I can't get to, deep oceans or um, polluted waters, but this device is gonna to go to Jupiter's moon Europa. I mean, we look for water on other planets to know that we will find life there, right? But we also need to protect the water here on our planet because it provides the life for all of us, right? So I know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking, wow, you know, what you do is really dangerous, girl. <laughs> and aren't you scared? And I'm like, yeah, of course I'm scared. That's the number one question that I get asked by people. And so I'm gonna answer it for you right now. I'm scared and I wanna dive with people that are scared. I wanna explore with people that are scared because it means that we care about the outcome of our choices. It means that we care about our work and we wanna come home safely at the end of the day. So everybody that's on this call today, I want you to be explorers. I want you to step towards something that scares you a little bit and step into the darkness, right? Because when you stand in the doorway of that underwater cave system or whatever it is that scares you, your eyes will adjust to the light. And that's where you have the opportunity to do something that's new for yourself, to learn something new. That's where you become an explorer. Maybe you'll even discover something that's completely new for humanity. And that's an incredible opportunity. And I know that you're all explorers or you wouldn't be on this call today. You're curious and you want to learn. And I just applaud you for being here today and encourage you to continue in your exploration experiences. So I think maybe I should stop uh, my screen share here and answer a few of your questions that are gonna be relayed to me now. Oh, so anything goes. <laughs> my goodness, that was incredible. Um, <laughs> I am in awe and inspired, and I hope everyone else is. Um, so if you have any questions, if you're watching us and you have any questions, just pop them in the Q&A section um, and I'll ask Jill and uh, answer all your questions. In the meantime, I have some. Um, so I was wondering, um, maybe some uh, someone watching was will, might wonder too, what made you want to become an explorer? How did you get onto this path to becoming an underwater explorer? 
you know, I really think that it started um, so early in my childhood. Like I was always curious. Um, I always asked the teachers for more work, you know, <laughs> think new things that I could learn. Uh, so I, I think it's sort of innate. Uh, you know, when I would walk to school, I would try to to walk a different route to school. I always really enjoyed that. Um, now. I didn't have the the sort of funds or even awareness of scuba diving when I was a little kid. So I didn't learn to scuba dive until I was in university, till I kind of earned my own money and and um, signed up for a scuba class and bought my equipment. Um, but I mean, today, if you're 10 years old, you can start a scuba class. And if you're younger, you can still start like snorkeling and learning about the underwater environment and becoming a better swimmer. So I wish I had started when I was super young. I did lots of other water sports, um, but you have an opportunity to, uh, to start really young today. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, that's so interesting how everyone has different paths to where they come and how they get to where they, they, um, where they are. Um, mm -hmm. Barbara asks, what has been the most challenging dive that he, that you have made? Boy, um, you know, I think some of those dives in Antarctica inside that iceberg were some of the most challenging and possibly some of the most dangerous, um, because there were very strong currents that we experienced inside the iceberg. I mean, first of all, we experienced big pieces of ice breaking, calving away from the iceberg. In one case, it even sort of blocked the doorway that we'd gone in and we had to find another way out. Um, but the very strong currents at one point sort of pinned us down inside the, the iceberg and made it almost impossible for us to get out. So we turned a one hour dive into a three hour fight for our lives. And I remember swimming back to the boat that day and we were so, you know, two hours overdue. So the team on the boat was just, you know, terribly worried about us. And I looked up at the science director and I said, the cave tried to keep us today. <laughs> it was really, really scary. I, that sounds terrifying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, did you go back in the next day? I did. <laughs> so here's the crazy thing. And, and I mean, I, I go into great detail in my book into the planet on this, but um, we sat down to dinner that night and thought, wow, oh, you know, we need a little bit more footage um, and did one more, one more dive. And about an hour after our last dive, the entire iceberg we'd just been inside of broke apart and turned into a sea of slush as far as the eye could see. And um, it was just, it's time. And I, I remember just sort of standing on the deck going, it's time for us to go home. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like it was just the most extraordinary thing I've ever seen. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Mm hmm. Wow. I have always wanted, like for, for a long time now, I've been wanting to go to Antarctica, but I don't know that I could ever dive in a, in a moving iceberg. Does it move fast? Well, you know what's funny is the first big iceberg that we encountered in the Ross Sea, like on our way to the B-15 iceberg, we thought, oh, here's a really nice, like stable looking iceberg. Let's just tie the boat to the iceberg and start to do some diving um, so that we can get our gear organized and our techniques organized. So it would give us a chance to turn the boat off for a while and conserve some fuel. So we anchored to the iceberg and started doing some diving and, uh, you know, we experienced some interesting currents, some interesting vertical currents and things. But when I got back on the boat, what I didn't really sort of equate in all of this, it felt like I was diving around an island, right? But then the captain informed us that, well, we can't just stay tied up to this iceberg because we're being blown north at a really fast pace. <laughs> I'm like, oh, we are, but it just felt like an island to me. And so I really sort of lost the concept of the fact that the boat and the iceberg and me were all like moving north at the time. So um, yeah, they can move fast. I mean, they can move seven or eight knots. <laughs> and you have to make up that distance again in the boat when you take the anchor off. Do you know what is what is so striking about what you say is that a lot of the people watching this or who might watch it later they won't recognize 
the planet that you're talking about because it's such mm -hmm. a different world that you're experiencing and yet it is our planet that they are mm -hmm. seeing that you're showing us from just a different angle um, mm -hmm. from the inside out and so if there was a message you wanted people to remember about that what what would it be well, I think we're all living that message right now during these COVID times, during lockdowns and isolations. There isn't a single person on this planet that could argue that we are not interconnected. <laughs> we are so interconnected, like a tiny little virus that we can't even see that began in one spot has completely moved all over the planet. Now, you know, imagine that's a drop of water. I mean, we don't have new water. It's the same water that we've had all along that we're recycling and reusing. I mean, I might be drinking a glass of water that has condensation from Shakespeare's breath in it, right? <laughs> I mean, we're so connected and this is all the water that we'll ever have. And so we need to protect it because what we do here can affect someone on the other side of the earth. Or if we don't help people on the other side of the earth do things to help promote clean water, then it will affect us or affect the animals in the ocean that, that share this planet with us. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Wow. And, and that's talking about our planet, but you mentioned a few times in the presentation that some of the technology that you've been using here is going to go to other worlds and mm -hmm. that you wanted to be an astronaut. Is yeah. that something that you're still hoping to do? Do you hope <laughs> to go? to the moon or to Mars, maybe. Absolutely, I would love to. I mean, just recently, there was a, a Japanese explorer that posted online that he has purchased a trip around the dark side of the moon from Elon Musk for 2022. And he has space to take eight artists with him. And so he was sent out a global um, invitation for people to apply. So I applied. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I don't know, but I think next month he's going to announce uh, at least the finalists. Uh, but, you know, I, I keep I keep looking for a new angle to go to outer space because I'd really like to see our great big blue planet, you know, floating in the atmosphere and see that that vision of the Earth yeah. um, that would feel so complete to me. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, I know if I've seen a few people who've applied for that. It's something that I don't think I'd ever dare to do, but uh, that, yeah, I wish you all the best of luck with that one. <laughs> and what, what about coming back to planet Earth? Are there still spaces that you hope to explore? Where on Earth would you like mm -hmm. to go next? Yeah, uh, well, I discovered that there are caves everywhere. I've, I've managed to dive on every continent and every ocean. I've managed to dive every province and territory in Canada, but there's still so much to do, even just to explore in my own backyard. I, I mean, if I was like, if I was isolated in my own homestead for the rest of my life, I would still have a never ending exploration opportunity. Um, but, you know, as soon as we get this COVID thing under control, I've had a vaccination and travel opens up again, then I look forward to getting back to putting some of those expeditions that got postponed back in the calendar. Like I have work in Newfoundland and the Arctic and Micronesia. So all over, all over the world. And uh, I look forward to that. And we look forward to following on your following your adventures. Is there mm -hmm. someone that somewhere that people can follow you or, or can yeah. see what you get up to? Absolutely. If you um, reach out to me at my website, intotheplanet.com. So if there's anyone that's watching this like later on, on YouTube, um, just drop me an email if you have a question on intotheplanet.com or, or check out my book if you want to sort of read all about the expeditions and, and work that I've done or for little kids, the Aquanaut to encourage you to be an explorer in whatever area you're interested in. Awesome. And I'll just ask you one last question that I ask everyone uh, that comes on. If you had some piece of advice for anyone watching who wanted to go and work with the oceans or with the water in some way, shape or form, what would you say to them? Well, I would say that anything is possible if you put your hard work and your mind to something. I mean, I created a career as an underwater explorer. <laughs> 
<laughs> and it wasn't like I could just go to school for that, right? Uh, but with today's, you know, globally interconnected world and the internet, you can do anything you set your mind to. So chase your dreams, know that it's possible, work hard, volunteer, and uh, the opportunities will come to you. Put yourself out there. Yeah. Um, we actually have one last question that came through from an audience member. Um, mm -hmm. What is the difference between life in cold water caves and warm water caves? Oh, it's really different, actually. Like I'm working on um, uh, a cave near my home that's got 10 kilometers of underwater passages. And it's very cold in the wintertime, like as cold as it can get without freezing solid. Um, and there's an incredible biomass in that cave of sponges and bivalves like you know, shells um, and uh, fish coming and going. Um, now in uh, caves in more tropical environments, like sometimes we're diving in caves that transition from the land to the ocean. And so we have freshwater and saltwater zones in the very same cave. And those tend to be um, really colorful. So we'll get colorful sponges in those where um, in, some of the like the northern caves that I'm diving in right now, it's a lot more um, pale or albino life that I'm seeing. Um, but yeah, they're they're really really different looking. And well, every cave I get to go in is a little bit different too. So it's it's fun to document the differences. Amazing. Well, Jill, thank you so much because that was really inspiring and um, just you are someone that I definitely look up to and I'm sure many of the people uh, <laughs> watching do too. So thank you so much for being a pioneer um, and explorer and for giving us a glimpse into your world. Um, it was really amazing. Thanks. Thanks. It was really fun to join you and thanks for putting up with the... Uh with the random alarm <laughs> test today. <laughs> Just shows you, we all have to be ready to deal with the unexpected. <laughs> exactly, it happens not to yeah. agree. So thank you so much. And for everyone watching, uh, you can join us next time. Um, visit our website, Sharks for Kids, uh, forward slash webinars to see who's coming next. And our website also has lots and lots of resources like coloring sheets and fact sheets that you can go and check out. And Jill shared her website. It's up there on the screen. So feel free to go and check her out as well. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye-bye.